I can't believe you lost your job. What? I'm trying to do my very best, How okay? How are we supposed to support our family? I, I'm going to have to go get another job. I, you know what? I'm just trying, okay? How are you trying? You I don't even help me with the kids. We have two kids. One teenager and we have a little girl. Who needs her daddy? I'm trying to work. I'm trying to get money so that I can support you guys, so that you guys can buy all the, all the things you guys want. What else do you guys want from me? No, you didn't try. You went to work late. You came home you early. Know, what do you mean late? What do you mean late? I hardly ever go to work late. Oh, once in a, once in a while, I, come, I go to work late. Wow, wow, I, get, I go to work late. Why? Because you get traffic on the road. Hello? It's amazing that there are times where we're, we face opposition and we face obstacles, but in the midst of it, God shows up. Now, I don't know what you go through. We all go through all kinds of things, but God came to bring us good news. He's a God of good news. And if God had a newspaper, I wonder what it would read every morning. Because we're, we're attracted to bad news. When we watch TV it's, and we turn on the news, there's a lot of bad news. We watch television programs that have bad news on it. And I thought, Lord, if you had a newspaper, what would it look like? Well, how would it, how would it speak to us? And I think for many of us today, we've, we've had our share of bad news, but at the same time, we've, we've also had our share of good news. Now, you might be in a season right now where it is bad news. And you're trying to find what is good about it. Is there any good thing that can come out of this? Well, during this series, God's good news, we're going to find that God still has good news. There is still good that is happening in this world. There is still good that is going to happen in our lives. We just need to look for it. Because in the midst of our trials and darkness, God will always shine his light. I want you to take out your bulletins with me, if you would. And in your bulletins, there's a place where you can take out your your notes, and you can follow along. But we're going to be talking about God's good news, but specifically the God who blesses. God is a God who blesses, and he's the one that will show us what it means to be blessed. Sometimes we think blessings are things, and it may be a part of it. We sometimes think blessings are finances, more money. It can be a part of it. But there's more to things and finances when it comes to God's blessing. We're going to learn to focus on the God who blesses and how that affects us. Now, we can get caught up in the side, on the side of, well, I just want things from God. And it's true, we pray to God for certain things, and it's okay. But we want to find the balance between praying to God for things and praying to God to get to know God because there's a difference. So I want to do a, a quick exercise with you. I want you to yell out good or bad, okay? Your cell phone breaks, good or bad? Good, is that good? <laughs> Hang on to that thought. Uh, working in extreme hot conditions and you're sweating, bad. <laughs> yes, yeah, so for some people it's good. Uh, a male, as a male, as a male teenager, being approached by a girl grabbing your shirt, ready to punch you in your face. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with you guys. You're like, oh, that's pretty good. You need counseling. Uh, so for those of you who think a broken phone is good, you are probably saying it's good because you want an upgrade, don't you? <laughs> Which is true. So the reason why I ask these questions is because if your phone breaks, and to you it's good, it's probably because you wanted an upgrade. So it, de it depends on your perspective or what you're dealing with that would make something good or bad. Uh, working in hot conditions and you're sweating all day. For some of you, you're saying, that's bad. Some of you are saying, that's good, I'm trying to lose weight. So it's dependent on where you are and what you're dealing with. As a male teenager being approached by a girl, grabbing your shirt ready to punch your face, that can be a bad thing unless she becomes your wife. And in that case, in this case, it was me. That's how Heidi and I met. So it can be a good thing depending on where you are. When it comes to the blessings of God, sometimes we don't know if it's God or if it's not God. Is God blessing me or is he not blessing me? 
Now, we're going to look at the prophet Joel, because Joel brought some good news when it looked like it was bad news. And the prophet Joel, he, he directed his message to Judah, and more specifically to the city of Jerusalem, which is in Israel. And Joel was an educated, well-read leader who knew not only the writings of other prophets, and, and he's in the Bible, but also the current events of his day. So he was well aware of what was taking place around him. He was in tune with the current topics and, and what was happening with the weather and, and uh, natural disasters. And he used them all to illustrate the message that God gave to him. And Joel, actually, he actually effectively used an invasion of locusts that occurred during his day as a primary word picture. So when the locusts came and just devoured the land and their crops, he used that as a word picture. And he utilized this natural catastrophe to underscore his message of repentance, which means turning away from our evil desires and turning towards God. So he used that as a word picture, and he spoke of, of the day of the Lord. That was his kind of like his catchphrase, his, uh, his motto, his mission statement, or, or his, uh, what he stood by. He's, he talked about the day of the Lord, which would come much like the locust surprising and terrifying and he attempted to awaken the people of judah from their spiritual apathy because they were drifting from god and their disobedience and then he provoked them to return to the lord and so we're going to find that joel had that kind of heart it's kind of like our denomination if you don't know we're called foursquare and our founder amy simple mcpherson when she founded this denomination it was all about jesus christ and people and the things that she would do, and it was during the Great Depression as, as uh, things weren't going well, that she opened up soup kitchens and, and fed the homeless. And within two short years, within her church in Los Angeles, there were 12 languages being spoken at her church. It was a multilingual church, 12 languages within two years. Her name got famous. She became famous, spreading across the, the country, and, and people were flocking to her sermons just flocking. But true fame came in 1921 when Amy Simple McPherson, who is the founder of Foursquare, helped a crippled woman in the audience rise from her wheelchair. And the audience proclaimed her as a faith healer. But she modestly refused credit. And she said, no, 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 no. I am not the healer. Jesus is the healer. I am only the little office girl who opens the door and says, come in. And that's the heart behind what Joel is trying to do. Joel is saying, listen, these are things that are taking place in the nation. Yes, there's a, a catastrophic event that just took place with this, this, these locusts. But I want you to understand the day of the Lord, what the Lord is trying to say. It's just like our church in what we're trying to do. Our heart is to reach lost people one relationship at a time. I was once lost before I knew Christ. Someone reached out to me. I found Jesus Christ. And what Joel is trying to do is he's trying to let the people know that you still have an opportunity to turn from your ways and turn towards this God, even in the midst of a difficult season where the locusts have ta has taken over your crops and now you're in this depressive state. Now your economy is failing. Joel is saying there's still opportunity because there is a God. And so here's something that we got to understand. Number one, that God blesses generations, not just me, not just you. That's the kind of God we serve. He doesn't just serve, he doesn't just bless us as individuals. He blesses generations. He continues on. Joel's message was simple concerning God's blessing. Joel called the leaders of his day to sound a warning of repentance to successive generations that he would never meet. In other words, Joel put his hand to the plow, not just for the people of his day, but for the people of tomorrow. That he knew that God was a God who would bless the generations, that it wasn't about what we're trying to do today, but what we're trying to do today for tomorrow, for future generations. He says in Joel 1, verses 2 and 3, he says, Hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land... In all your history, has anything like this happened before? Tell your children about it in the years to come and let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. What Joel was doing was he was, he was saying caution to future generations 
of what was happening because it affects them. He wasn't just speaking to the parents, he was also speaking to the children. All the mistakes, the sins, the wrongs we've done, he's saying. Saying the Lord says, I want to bless your future generations, so be cautious of how they behave, lest they bring down the same awful devastations you have encountered. And when it comes to relationships, I can speak into my family's life. I can speak into my children's life because as parents, we've been through that. As parents, you can speak into your children's lives because you've been through that. And Joel was saying, listen, what you're going through now, don't just look at it and say, well, life is over. Take it, go to God and find out what you need to do and how he's blessing you through this time period because your children are going to experience the same kind of thing. And if they don't understand that there is a, a God who blesses, then they're not going to be able to live the life that God has promised to them. They're just going to go with the flow and the stream and the currents of what the world is doing. And Joel says, no, no, don't do that. You let them know what is happening. You let the future generations know how good God is and what he's doing. And the glory of God, you pass that on to the next generation. Some uh, uh, students and youth would tell me, uh, because I would talk to them about the difficult times I had as a teenager and, and, you know, being a teenage father and my dad passing away at an early age, you know, being under a single parent household and, and my mom being in welfare and us not having anything. We didn't have a car. Bus was our transportation. So I would explain that to the kids and they would say, yeah, but you turned out all right. So I'll be fine too. And I said, well, okay, well, let me just illustrate it this way. Because sometimes we think that too. We think, well, if so-and-so turned out okay, or if so-and-so in the Bible turned out okay, I'll be fine. I can do this. God will forgive me. I'll, he, I have his grace, so I can do whatever I want to. But I, I looked at it this way. Life, my life, and what I explain to these kids or anybody who says, well, you turned out okay. When I say I turned out okay, I don't mean that as psychologically. I'm just saying my life is okay. I looked at it this way. that in life, there's, there are these certain areas that if we step on, it blows up. I look at life as like a minefield. And I started off this way. And my parents and people who loved me would say, don't go through that. Go around it. Avoid that. Do good things. But I would think, why? I can get through this minefield. And so as I went on in life, oh, blow up here. Oh, I tried to heal. I tried to navigate through. I tried to sneak my way through life. Tried to take shortcuts and boom, blow up over here. So I blew up here, blew up here, and I've made mistakes in my life every single person has. And by the time I got out on this side, you know, uh, my foot was swollen because it was broke. Uh, my arm was broken. Uh, this hand was swollen because it, you know, was infected. Uh, half of my hair got burnt, so I only had half spikes going on. And so I came out on the other end wounded. Thanks be to God for his healing. So God heals. And although there's memories of all of these times where I got hit, it doesn't hurt anymore. It's now a testimony for what God can do. However, what I let other people know is, I now found a better way. Instead of going through the minefield, go around the minefield and go straight to God. Because then you'll, you won't have to go through all of this to end up in the same place. Because not too many people survive the minefield. Some people stay there all their life and they get blown up from one thing to the next. And instead of turning to God, we turn to our own self and things that we want to do. We, we, we fall into our own fleshly desires and we, we do things that we're not proud of. And God says, why don't you just turn to me? It's a lot better that way. See, God is not just the God who takes care of our past. He is the everlasting, purposeful God who takes care of our future not only helps us in our past or our mistakes, he looks out for our future, which is the second thing, that I must turn to God to be blessed. And it's pretty simple. I must turn to God to be blessed. 
Well, doesn't God bless even those who don't turn to him? I have uh, two grandchildren, Jaden and Landon. When they come over to my house, and maybe your grandchildren do this, when they come over to your house, they open the refrigerator. Like three and two years old. They open the refrigerator. Papa, I want snacks. I want snacks. So they'll look in the refrigerator, and they'll scan the whole thing. See, men, it starts at an early age. They scan the whole refrigerator, and then they're looking for snacks. And I say, Papa got snacks. And so they say, I want snacks. They turn to me for the snacks. And so I'll get the snacks out. I get it prepared for them. I'll get a bowl for them, and I'll put it in the bowl, and I'll have them share it or give them separate bowls. But they turn to me because they know that Papa is the one that's going to make this happen. He's going to make it happen. I can try it myself, and they have before, but they spilt it. It didn't work out. They got, you know, spankings for it because they weren't listening. So they knew that, that I'm not going to do that again. This time, I'm going to rely on Papa because he's going to make it work. And that's what Joel was saying to the people. He's saying, look, you can try it yourself. You can probably help yourself, and you can survive. But turn to God because God is going to make it work. He's the one that's going to make it happen. Well, what if, what if I don't turn to God? Will I still be blessed? What if I don't give to God? What if I don't tithe to God? Will I still be blessed financially? Yes, you will. But here's what the Bible says. His, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that's not in your notes, but that's Matthew 5.45. So yes, God will bless us. Yet, the greatest blessing you and I will receive is not what we get from God. The greatest blessing you and I will ever receive from God is God. So you can say, well, I don't need to turn to God because I'm being blessed by God. Absolutely. But the greatest blessing you and I will ever receive is not what we get from God. It is God himself. That is the greatest blessing. Because in the end, if we never turn to God, and even though we were blessed by God, in the end of, of, of our life, we will hope we knew God. Because that's where the blessing is. It's in God. It's not in things. It's in God. Things are okay, but the greatest blessing is God himself. Well, how do I know if what is happening is a blessing from God? How do I know if it's him? I mean, what if I go Vegas and I hit it big? How do I know if, what, is that God's blessing? What if, I, what if I do something wrong and God blesses me? How do I know if it's him or not? What if I feel that it is him? Well, here's the, here's the good and not so good. You won't know. You won't know if it's God or not. Because if we feel that we can just say it was God blessing me, then we will justify every behavior that is not of God. And we will say, no, God is blessing me. You can be married and someone's flirting with you. You say, oh, God must be sending me a new person. <laughs> Out with the old, in with the new. God, you sent me this person. Oh, they make me feel so good. And God is saying, you're missing it. Joel 2.12, because we won't know if it's the Lord, says this, that is why the Lord says, Turn to me now. While there is still time, he says, give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. And God is saying, you're not going to know. That's why he says, turn to me now while, while there is still time. In whatever situation you're dealing with, he says, turn to me now while there is still time. He says, come with fasting, and weeping, and mourning. Fasting is one of the most powerful spiritual things that we can do. Because it denies our flesh, and, and it is one of the, the best spiritual disciplines of all the Christian disciplines. And through fasting and prayer, it's, the Holy Spirit can transform one's life. In most cases, a spiritual fast involves abstaining from food while focusing on prayer. And fasting requires self-control because you're staying away from certain foods or food in general and, and just having water. It's a discipline as one who denies the flesh and all of its desires. Spiritual fasting is not a way to earn God's favor, nor is it a way to say to God, well, I'm fasting, so you need to do this for me. That's not what it's about. But rather, 
The purpose is to produce a transformation in us. A clear, more focused attention, dependence on God, not saying that, oh, I'm doing something spiritual, look at me. In fact, when you're fasting, nobody else should know. Remember what Jesus said? When you fast, don't, don't you know, he said, clean yourself up. Don't, don't make yourself look like you're fasting because in those days when they would fast, they would put, you know, dust on their hair and they would, their clothes would be torn and they would look like they were fasting. And Jesus said, you don't, don't look like you're fasting. You don't have to tell anybody. God knows because that's a spiritual discipline. Fasting is never to be a public display of spirituality. It is between you and God alone. And what Joel was saying is when you come to God, it's between you and God. That's why he says, come to me with fasting. Then he says, come to me with weeping. In other words, there, there must be an outward expression of sorrow. And a, almost like a regret as an act of repentance. Otherwise, it's not heartfelt. And instead of us having that weeping kind of uh, uh, emotion to us, and, and instead of us saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry and I'm repentive to you, God, because of the things I've been doing or, or my lifestyle, we're just sorry we got caught. And so he's saying, you got to come to me with, with weeping. Not that, not that if you're not weeping, it's not a true act of repentance, but what he's saying is there's a heart issue there that you need to come to me with and come to me with mourning, that tears from the sins that we've committed now turns into tears for the sin that caused it, that you, we're so sorrowful that we've done this against God. And he says, that's how I want you to come to me. And when you turn to me, that you're coming to me with a repentive heart. And all of these, this fasting, weeping, and mourning is just a mere proof that we're repentive. How often we've said sorry to God, sorry to people, but do the very same thing right after that. Yeah, we say we're sorry, but we don't mean it because we never change. And God says, you don't do that with me. I want to bless you. I want to bless you beyond your belief, but you got to come to me with that kind of repentive heart. Otherwise, you will not be able to handle my blessing. You need a repentive heart in order to handle what I'm going to give to you. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll be smothered by my blessing, and I would not do that to you. I'm a good God. And so he says, that's how you got to come to me. See, one of the greatest blessings of God is being weaned off of things And be dependent on him. And he says, you gotta, when you come to me, you come to me with weeping, fasting, and mourning. In other words, don't be dependent on things. Be dependent on me. Joel 2, 13 and 14, it says, don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. And then Joel kind of switches gears. He says, who knows? Perhaps he will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this curse. Perhaps you will be able to offer grain and wine to the Lord your God as before. In other words, that he would bless you even greater than where you were before because of your repentive heart. What they would do in those times when you were repentive, again, they would tear their clothing, as, uh, their clothing as an act of repentance. That they were so sorrowful that they would tear their clothes. And God says, no, no, no sense tear your clothes if you're still going to hate yourself. I would rather you tear your heart so that I can do something in the midst of the trials that you're going through. And when I do that, I'm going to cleanse you from the inside and out. In other words, there's no question that when we tear our hearts, that God will come in and do something magnificent because he is the God who blesses. And who knows? And there's no question, but what if we truly repent of our sins and God forgives us? And when he does, that may be what was going to happen, what Joel is saying is what, what, whatever consequence was going to happen, what if it doesn't happen because you repented? It's not guaranteed because there are consequences to our sin, but he says, what if it's held back because you repented? And even though God forgives us, whether he will remove that affliction or, or whatever is gonna come our way, it's not promised, yet the probability of it being removed should cause us towards repentance. 
it should cause our hearts to say to God, you are the God who blesses. So yes, there may be consequences coming up. There could be jail time. There could be a, a fine coming up. It could be a, a divorce settlement coming up. It could be something coming up that you feel, I don't want to hit that mark. It could be foreclosure. It could be a relationship going bad. Whatever it would be, and you're hoping it doesn't happen. Joel is encouraging us to repent while there is still, still time. Because who knows that maybe God might hold back or whatever it is that God would send us a blessing instead of whatever it was that was going to curse us or whatever it was that was going to put us down or, or hold us back. And, and Joel is saying, just turn to God. Turn to him. And the last thing Joel reminds us is to look. Look for God's blessing. Look for his blessing. Because it's there. See, when, when the locusts came and devoured the entire land, think about it, that's, that was their livelihood. That was their economy. And when the locusts took over the land, pretty much everyone was in depression. Again, economic collapse. And Joel says, you got to look for God in this. In, in, in whatever state you're in, look for God. Because God's blessing is there. But sometimes we just don't know what to look for. I was at the... Uh, traveling and I was at uh, LAX, the uh, airport in LA, and I didn't know where to go because we had to uh, meet in a certain area to catch the uh, shuttle that was going to our hotel. So when we got there, I, I saw the gentleman that was standing there and he had a uniform on, so unfortunately, we assume that they know where we should go. And I said, excuse me, sir, uh, I'm trying to get to this certain place uh, do you know where I need to go? And he says, yeah, just take that escalator downstairs and then you're going to take a left and you're going to head into that open door right on the left-hand side. And I'm looking. Now, there's an escalator going up and he's pointing to that escalator. And I said, where do I go? He said, you take that escalator and you go downstairs. Now, I'm looking at this thing. The escalator is going up. And I'm thinking, is this an optical illusion? Is this... Are they going to put me on YouTube? What is this? So I'm watching, and I said, those escalators? He goes, yeah. Now he's getting upset at me because I don't know what he's talking about. And I said, you want me to go downstairs? And then he looks at me like I'm an idiot. He goes, yeah, that's where it is. And I said, but the escalator is going up. He goes, no, the, the escalator right there. And I said, I don't get it. And then he rolls his eyes at me. He goes, it goes down. Now, Heidi's with me. And I'm ready to turn to her and ask her, am I blind? Is, are those escalators going down? And so she kind of catches it. And she says uh, to the guy, oh, no, we're, we're trying to go downstairs. He goes, yeah, the escalator is behind that. I said, well, why did, why did you just say that? Why did how come you just, why didn't you just tell me it's behind that? And, and now I'm trying to be Christian about it. So I said, you should have just told me that it's behind it. He says, well, it's right there. Oh, I had so much ammunition. I was ready to just unleash on him that I'm not working here. You've been working here for years. I can tell. You've been working here for a long time. That's what I wanted to say. But that's not how I wanted to represent the Lord. So I had to wrestle with it. And so I said, so right behind that is the escalator going down. He says, yes. Almost like, yes, you moron. That's what I read from him. <laughs> Maybe I had issues. And as I'm leaving, I'm, I want to tell him something. Because I'm not going to see the guy again, you know. So I'm figuring, hey, he don't know who I am. But I don't. It's like the Lord says, you still represent me whether or not this person knows you. So I said, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And then I left. Now, that all could have been avoided if I knew where I was going. If I knew what to look for, all of that could have been avoided. I had no idea what I was looking for. Even when that person pointed out where to go, I still had no clue what he was talking about. Now, when God says he's blessing us, sometimes we don't even know what to look for. We need people to point us in the right direction. But even though people may speak to our lives and into our lives and point us the way, we still don't know what we, God is doing. That's why we have to look. 
for his blessing. God is always blessing his people. But sometimes we don't look. And we use that phrase, count your blessing. Because there are times where we don't, we don't know that God is blessing us. But he is always blessing us. We just need to look. See, sometimes what we're actually doing is we're looking for things rather than for God himself. Joel 2, 19 and 24 the Lord will reply, and he says, look. And you can circle that word if you're taking notes or underline it. He says, look, I am. Everybody say that word together. Ready, go. I am. Sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy your needs. You will no longer be an object of mockery among the surrounding nations. The threshing floors will again be piled high with grain, and the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. And what Joel is reminding us that the Lord is saying that God's blessing comes with the promise of a kind of relief that we so desperately need. That God's blessings are more than we could possibly imagine. That we just need to look for it. He's saying the new grain, the new wine, the olive oil, they were all temporal blessings in their day, which the locusts came and destroyed. But God promises to restore. And to restore, not just to the extent that was barely necessary, but in full abundance and measure. That's what Joel was saying. So much that you would be satisfied, that it wouldn't be a temporary thing that's happening, that God will satisfy you because he's blessing you, that God's blessings satisfies us to overflowing. That's what Joel was reminding the people of. And sometimes we look for God's blessing in things that are only good as in a broken phone, working in hot conditions or getting punched by a girl. We look for the temporal blessings, and God says, you're missing it altogether. Yes, I will still bless you, but even when things don't look so great, look to the one who is eternal, who is able to bring about blessings out of devastation. Joel 2, 25, 26, the Lord says, I will, say, I will, I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locust and hopping locust and stripping locust and the cutting locust. It was I, watch this, it was I who sent this great destroying army against you. Once again, you will have all the food you want, and you will praise the Lord your God who does these miracles for you. Never again will my people be disgraced. You may think, wait a minute. So that means God sent this army and the locusts to devour the land? That's not blessing. That's a curse. Now, see, once again, we're looking at what is happening now, what God, not what God is doing for the future. How many of us came to the Lord out of pain? God knew what he was doing. Many of our lives made a dramatic turn of, 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 of something good because of a painful situation. God knows what he's doing. Don't look at the situation. Look at God. Well, does God send me pain? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he allows it, but he's always willing to be open for us to turn to him. We just got to look for the blessing in it. That maybe it's God's way of helping us to turn away and to turn towards him, but we got to look for it. Now, here's the reason why we go through what we go through in Joel 2.28. Then, after doing all those things, let's say this word together, ready, go, I will Pour out my spirit among, uh, upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. God is always at work bringing about the greater blessings in our lives even when we don't see it, even when devastation occurs, even when it's dark, even when we're, we're going through a painful situation. God will always bring about the greater blessing in our lives because he's always at work for the greater blessing. He is not obvious about it. He may not show us everything entirely, but God is not oblivious to what we're going through. He has not forsaken. He has not abandoned. He is bringing about a greater blessing than we could actually realize. We just need to look for him. We've got to ask and look for God in it, not in things. That's why God put eternity in the heart of man. Because we have a longing for something greater than us, something of eternal, of eternal value, something something that only God can fulfill. And God put, the eternity, put eternity in our hearts so that we seek after him. 
That's why it's there. But we seek after things thinking that that's going to satisfy us permanently. Only God can do that. It's amazing that social scientists and anthropologists are shocked and surprised, uh, surprised that globally there's a sense of eternity in the hearts of peoples everywhere. And they liken it to evolution. That in our evolution process, there's this thing called God in this whole process. But we know the truth. We know the truth that God places eternity in the heart. Men and women longing to know who God is, longing to get to know this God, longing to know who he is and what he represents. And who is this God and, and what can he do for me? That God is faithful even in times of devastation and barrenness. God will always be faithful. That's why he put eternity in the hearts of man. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10, it says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from beginning, from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Some people ask, what is the good news? Is the good news that Jesus died for us and then was raised from the grave and forgave us of our sins? Yes, it is. But there's so much more to God's good news. Eternal life is great news. But it doesn't have to start when we die. God's good news is everlasting. There is still good news in our world today, and it comes from God. We serve a God who brings us good news. That's how God blesses us, because he is a God who blesses. Amen. And close your Bibles and put away your notes. I want to read this to you because it's a, it's just a reminder for us that how we can be with God sometimes. We have our marriage classes that meets on Tuesday nights, and it's called Love and Respect. And just powerful things are happening on Tuesday nights. And if you're involved uh, in that class, Love and Respect, it's just a powerful time, and, and you understand what's happening. I'm, I just want to read this. It says, there is an innate need for a man to feel respected and honored. It is also, there is also an innate need for a wo woman to feel loved and secured. Love and secure. That's pretty much what's happening. But that's the heart behind love and respect in this marriage class. That there is an innate need for a man to feel respected and honored. It is also an innate need for a woman to feel loved and secured. In this class, we have learned and experienced that when a wife does not feel loved, she negatively reacts and responds disrespectfully. Then without respect, a man tends to respond not by being loving. The result is what we call the crazy cycle. Let me explain the crazy cycle. It just keeps spinning, cycling, until either he begins to be loving despite the disrespectful actions, attitude of his wife, or she is respectful despite the unloving actions or attitudes of her husband. When this happens, we then enter into the energizing and rewarded cycles. His love, regardless of her respect, her respect, regardless of his love, we do this as unto the Lord. Unfortunately, unconditional love and respect does not come naturally. However, it is commanded by God. And because it does not come naturally, men and women have to make a conscious choice or decision to do it purposefully. The greatest blessing in our own marriage and in the testimonies of each couple is when we are conducting ourselves as God has instructed. The power of God is released into our relationships through our obedience, the response is that we get off the crazy cycle and become passionate about meeting each other's needs as our needs are being met. We become friends again. Passion is restored and families are made stronger. And it is no different with God. Sometimes we're in this crazy cycle. We do things over and over again. We wait for God and God waits for us. 
God says, I want to bless you. And we're saying, why don't you bless me? God is saying, I want to bless you, but you need to turn to me. Why don't you go first, God? He says, I already did. I sent you my one and only son because I love you with a passion. I died for your sins. I paid all the sins for your life, past and future sins. I'm going to pay for it all. I already went. I'm just waiting to bless you. I want to bless you. But it's your turn to turn to me now. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? Lord, for many of us, we have this relationship with you. We know what it means to be in this relationship with you. But sometimes we focus on bad news rather than good news. Sometimes we focus on good news, but it's, it's for our own self-gain. Lord, we really want to focus on you, the God of good news, because you are the God who blesses. I pray for every person here this morning who knows you and maybe does not know you yet, that, that they would understand, that we all would understand that you're the God of good news, that you're a God who blesses your people. You, you, you pour out your blessing on, on the evil and the good, which to us may sound insane. But that's your love towards people and you don't bless us so that we can turn toward the blessing. You bless us so that we turn towards you. Some of us might be in a devastating time period and it's not so that devastation can just occur. We don't know if it's from you or not. All we know is we need to turn to you. And so I pray that our hearts turn to you this morning. If you're here today and you're saying, I've never received God into my life. I've never given in my life. I've never turned to God. I want us to pray this prayer together. In fact, we can all pray this prayer, but especially for those who have never prayed this prayer to God. It's a prayer called salvation. That you're giving your life to Jesus Christ in exchange for his life for you, that he, he died for all of our sins, all the wrong things we've done against him. He said, you're forgiven. You just need to accept it. And that's what you're going to do right now. So will you pray with me? It's, and especially for those who are praying this for the very first time, mean it with all your heart. And here's the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you came and died on the cross and you rose again to give me eternal life. I give you my heart, I believe in you, and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to pray especially over those who just said yes to Jesus Christ. And if you did, could you just lift a hand real briefly, and all you're saying is, I said yes to Jesus this morning. Good, God bless you. Anybody else? God sees your hand, he sees your heart, he heard your prayer. Good, back there, God sees your hand. Good. Anybody else? Hold your hands up. Good. You can put your hands down. Lord, I pray your blessing over these that said yes to you. This is why we do what we do, Lord. It's to reach the lost one relationship at a time. These people matter to you, God, and they matter to us. That now they have eternal life with you. So I pray your blessing over them, over their families, that whatever situation they're in, if they're coming against an obstacle or they're, they're, they feel that there's just darkness around them or but there's no more hope left. Lord, that you would pour out your hope on them, that your spirit would be poured out on them, that your Holy Spirit would come alive in them, that they would have the power and the, the energy and, and the hope that comes from you to live their life according to your ways. For all of us, Lord, we turn to you. We will look for your blessing because you're the God who blesses and we thank you for speaking to us today. We honor you and thank you in Jesus' precious and powerful name we pray, we all said, Amen. Amen.